Yep, the belt grinder project is actually... Oh, wow. That looks really good. Now, if all the parts fit together just like they did in the CAD model, we'll be in business. Welcome back to Cloud42. I'm James. Today, we're starting a brand new project. I am building a belt grinder. And when I say I'm building one, I mean I designed one from scratch because I wanted to. This belt grinder is my own design, though you'll no doubt recognize some design cues and concepts that I saw and borrowed from other places. There are only so many ways to skin this cat. As usual, the drawings and cutting files will be available on Patreon if you want to build your own, though you might want to watch the videos first to see how it works out. I've been working on the design for this belt grinder in my spare time, <laughs> whatever that is, for the last year or so. I've looked at a lot of different belt grinders that are out there, both commercial and home built, and kind of adopted some of the design elements that I liked and uh, ignored the things that I didn't, came up with my own solutions for places where I didn't see something I really liked. I had kind of three design guiding principles, if you will, that I used when I designed this. The first is I wanted to make as much of it as possible from flat plate. So the base is flat plate, the sides of the frame are flat plate. A lot of the brackets are bent flat plate. The idea being that these could be burned out on a plasma table or laser cut either way, and you could avoid having to do a lot of machining to make the basic framework of the grinder. And that is the second attribute that I wanted is I wanted to have minimal machining. As much as possible, I wanted this just to be burned out on a plasma or cut on a laser and not have to spend a lot of time or have a lot of tools in the machine shop to be able to build this. And then the third element of the design is that I wanted to use as much off the shelf hardware as possible. Obviously all the fasteners are off the shelf. I opted to just buy a set of grinder wheels, the idlers, the tracking wheel and the drive wheel off the shelf. And uh, the kip handles are off the shelf and the handle up here and the tracking knob are all just off the shelf components that you can buy, making this relatively easy to assemble. And I limited the machining to a few situations like these recesses on the back of the idler plate and the uh, bushings for the, the tension arm. And I really tried to minimize that. What I did not want to have to do is to buy oversized stock and mill down all these long bars and do a lot of work that was gonna make this inaccessible for somebody with basic shop tools. So as much as possible, I tried to just leave stock nominal sizes and deal with most of the complexity through the laser or plasma cutting process. Let me turn some of this off and let's look through this uh, one step at a time. Starting with the frame, this is the main structure of the grinder, and this is essentially two quarter inch steel plates that sandwich three aluminum spacers. The idea here is to create two pockets, one for an arm to hold the idler wheels, and one for an arm to hold a tool rest or any other tooling that you want to put on the grinder. Since the plate on the right hand side here is also going to support the motor, I've got a second plate here as a doubler that is just sandwiched in with all of the screws that hold this together to the spacers, and that provides a full half inch thickness to support the weight of the motor. Because this is a two by 72 inch belt, and you generally, the guidance is you should have one horsepower per inch of belt width. I really wanted to have a two horsepower motor. That's pretty heavy, and so I've got the doubler on here so that I can have a full half inch of steel to support that. To make this easier to machine and perhaps a little bit more durable, instead of actually trying to thread holes in these side plates for the screw threads on the kip handles, I instead opted to just insert flange nuts. So if I turn off the spring and the washer here, you can see that this outer plate has a hexagon hole in it. And if I turn off that plate, you can see that the inner plate then just has a circular hole. So a flange nut fits in there and is captured. It really could just fall out to the inside. So to keep it tight against the outside plate so it doesn't fall out, that's the purpose of the washer and the spring around the kip handle. So if the, if the threads wear out or if anything happens, you can just replace the flange nuts. And it also simplifies the machining because 
these plates can come right off the plasma or right off the laser with the holes needed in place and you can just add the flange nuts later. The idler assembly is supported on a one and a half inch square piece of aluminum bar and the only machining required on this bar is to thread these two holes for a couple of hex head screws that hold the laser cut idler support plate onto the bar. And as you can see, this is slotted, so you can just loosen this and adjust the angle of the belt on the front. And then I've got a backing plate here to provide support with a platen behind the belt. And again, this is just a piece of bent steel plate with another piece of plate on the front. I opted ultimately to go with just mild steel, but you could do something more abrasion resistant or replace this with other kinds of tooling, like a convex surface for knife grinding. And then the bracket is just mounted in these slots with carriage bolts so you can move it in and out as required. The tool rest on this first version of the grinder is very similar. It's just an inch and a half aluminum bar with a piece of steel plate screwed to the top of it. Now this is just level. You, this does not articulate, but you could easily replace this bar with something with some extra joints in it if you needed that articulation later. For grinding at an angle, you can always tilt the idler plate and change the angle of the belt and platen for doing things like uh, tool grinding. So I think I'm gonna run it this way, and if at some point I do end up wanting an articulated tool rest, then I'll go ahead and design one. To tension the belt, the tension arm assembly pivots in these holes up here on the top and is supported by an air spring. I opted for the air spring because it's going to provide a little bit of damping and maybe reduce the vibration, though there really shouldn't be a lot of vibration in the system. I've got a very simple tracking pivot here with the tracking wheel just supported on a plate here, pivoting on a shoulder screw with a thumb screw on the side here for adjusting the angle for tracking purposes. The motor and the drive wheel, of course, just mount with four screws through the doubled plate here that supports the motor. And I opted for a seven inch drive wheel so that I can get north of 6,000 surface feet per minute with a typical 3,600 RPM motor. Uh, you can certainly swap out for a different wheel if you have a different wheel speed in mind. And then I went ahead and modeled the belt just so that I could make sure that a 72 inch belt was going to work with the geometry that I have here. All of this needs to sit on a base. So I designed a base also made from flat material here. So we've just got a quarter inch plate on the bottom and two legs that are also cut out of quarter inch plate and bent. Obviously, if you didn't have the ability to bend and you didn't want to pay somebody to do that, you could design something else here. I did align the screw holes. So there's three screws here on the top that attach to the frame and three screws here on the base that attach to the base plate. And those screws are exactly in line with one another. So it'd be very easy to design something else for the leg assembly if you wanted something else. For example, if you wanted this to be articulated so that you could pivot it and rotate it into a horizontal position for grinding, you could easily design a different leg system here. And again, because those screw holes are lined up, it should be easy to design something that just drops right in. And finally, since I am using a three phase motor here, I wanted to mount the VFD on top. So I opted for a 56C motor that has both the face plate mounting and a foot and I'm taking advantage of the motor foot to mount the VFD. So this is just another piece of bent quarter inch steel plate that gives a nice place to mount this. And this is the KB Electronics uh, KB AC 27D, I think, which is a two horsepower VFD. Uh, these are a little bit pricey compared to other kinds of import VFDs that are available, but I really like the simplicity of this. It just is a, has a start stop switch and a knob, and it is also sealed against dust, which I think is really important in this environment. If you had a typical VFD here with a fan that was sucking air through it, I think you would have a lot of trouble with getting grinding dust sucked through the VFD. So having one that is entirely sealed uh, against dust is a big advantage. And as long as we've got two different steel plates here on the right hand side, we might as well make some design elements out of it. So I went ahead and cut the 42, the Cloud 42 reference into the side here, 
and then opted to go with two different colors. Now, I got to give credit where credit is due. The idea to do this in black and red so that the text pops on that came from Yuchul Kim over at Woods Creek Workshop, and boy, it was a good idea. This thing is just beautiful. I did some renders of this that I think I posted on Instagram a while back, and I just completely fell in love with this color scheme. But that also means that I would have to paint it. So when I saw that Send Cut Send was offering powder coating services, I decided that's what I wanted to do. I reached out to them and asked them if they were interested in sponsoring this project, and they said yes. So I uploaded my DXF files, and they cut all of the flat plate parts. They did all of the bending, and they did the powder coating. These parts have been sitting on the floor of my office for about a month. I've been waiting for you to get here so that I could open them. The parts are all shrink-wrapped down to a sheet of cardboard. It keeps them from sliding around and getting dinged up, and it works pretty well. Boy, that powder coat is beautiful. It's got a little dirt on the surface, just needs to be wiped down. The tool rest is bare steel. It's what they call their hot rolled, pickled, and oiled, so it doesn't have mill scale on it, and that looks pretty decent. And boy, those big expanses of powder coat sure look clean. The legs are especially beautiful. There's no way I could have bent this material or finished it and made it look this good. This is pretty nice. I also ordered some little aluminum plates. These are part of the handle assembly on the arm. And yeah, more candy. That's exactly what I need. The arm is half inch steel and boy, that came out just as beautiful as the thinner stuff. I'm pretty impressed with their process. I'm not sure exactly how they do it, but they've got it down pat and boy, does that look nice. It's going to look great on the side of the grinder. Really glad I went with the two-tone color scheme. Backing plates also, the hot rolled, pickled and oiled. I thought about getting this in AR400 or AR500 plate just for fun, but uh, didn't decide to go that route. The idler plate is half inch aluminum, and while the edges are a little bit rougher than the steel parts, they look pretty good. They're quite sharp. I will need to deburr this a little bit, and we have a little bit of machining on those slots because the laser can't counter bore or counter slot them. We do, however, need to machine the spacers. These need to be about 20 thou wider than the square bars to leave room for the bars to slide freely. So we'll start with inch and three quarter stock and mill those down to width. We'll start though by milling all three spacers to length. Since we're gonna be doing a lot of repetitive setups here, I will set up a jaw stop on the second vise there so we can take the part out and put another one in and repeat the same location. We need to clean up one end of each part and the length at this point doesn't matter as long as they're long enough. All we need to do is get a good clean up on all three. Once we have one end cleaned up, we can turn the parts around, put them back in the vise one by one and butt the nice square end up against the stop and mill them to their final length. We're shooting for 11 and three quarters inches and we're within a thou, so that is good enough. Now we need to mill them to width. Now I'm laying down a parallel in the vise here and I found out later that that parallel isn't parallel when it's laid down on its side. So I had to do a lot of fiddling before I figured that out. Uh, fortunately, I figured it out before the parts were milled to their final width. So I didn't end up ruining them. I'm using a 50 millimeter four flute carbide insert face mill here with nice inserts for aluminum. And it just leaves a beautiful finish, very comparable to what one would get with the Superfly. However, it doesn't really matter because this surface is not gonna be visible when the grinder is assembled. With one side cleaned up, we'll flip it over and bring these to final width. I'm taking about 100 thou depth on each pass, and that seems to be working pretty well, leaving a nice finish, but I'll come back with a 5 thou final pass to clean it up and leave the best surface finish I can. I would like a chamfer on the ends of these, so I'm using a half inch 90 degree spotting drill as a chamfer mill, and it works great, especially in aluminum. I'm using the same stop, and I will just put all three parts in and do both ends and both sides. Of course, the last thing we need here is a bunch of tapped holes. 
So I will use the same stop. I will set up the first part and I will find the center using the half function in the DRO and locate the end. So we have a reference for the holes. Now for the holes, I'm gonna do the same thing you've seen me do over and over on this channel. I'll start with a 120 degree spotting drill to spot them. And I'll just use the vice stop to do this one hole in both sides of all three parts. And with that done, I'll come back with the tap drill and drill the hole a little bit further than halfway through from each side. And again, I'll do both sides of all three parts and then move down to the next hole and do exactly the same thing. There's five holes in each side of each part, so it's 30 drilled and tapped holes, which don't underestimate the amount of time that takes. I'm using a spiral flute tap that pulls the chips up out of the hole, but it would have been just as easy here to use a spiral point tap that pushes them down. And with the right tap, it might have been possible to tap all the way through, but an inch and a half is a pretty deep hole to tap a quarter 20 in aluminum. The support bars, by comparison, are much simpler. We'll start with the tool rest bar, and we'll just find the center using the DRO, locate the end, and then put in our two quarter 20 tapped holes. Just spot both, drill both, and then realize that they're not actually in the center of the bar. Whoops. Yeah, I located the center with the DRO, but I didn't actually drive the mill to the center. So let's rotate the bar 90 degrees and try again. This time actually centering up the mill before drilling. Just spot, drill, and tap as usual, and that should give us the two holes that we need to mount the tool rest. Those other two holes are what we call evidence, and a smart guy would have turned the bar the other direction so they would be hidden under the tool rest when it's installed on the grinder. The idler support bar is similar, except the holes are larger. In this case, we need a 3 8 hole for the pivot lock, and a half inch hole for the pivot itself. Now because these are larger, I will go ahead and run them all the way through the part. That way I can use a spiral point tap to do the tapping. Starting with the half inch. And it just pushes in with no drama at all. Same with the 3 8 though I can't reach all the way through so the threads won't go all the way through the hole. Since we're gonna be installing and removing tools over the life of the grinder, I'll put a nice generous chamfer on these to make that easy. And that's the support bars done. The idler support plate needs a couple of tapped holes and it needs some counter slots milled. And this is another case where the dual vice setup comes in super handy. This may not be the optimal way of holding it, but it's better than any of the other options I could come up with. And for the kinds of operations we're going to be doing here, we don't need to have a super heavy grip on the part. Just holding it in place will be plenty for the tapped holes. And as long as we're gentle, it should be fine for the slotting operation as well. Now, because this is a laser cut part and it's not perfectly square necessarily, I am going to locate the holes using a pin in the drill chuck. Now that I found the first hole, I'm gonna go ahead and drill this out to the tapping size. The laser was specified to cut it to tapping size, but there was a little bit of taper. I'm actually coming in from the narrow side and yeah, there's not really much in it. I think this would have been fine just tapping it directly, but I wanted to be sure because I didn't wanna wreck the part. It would take a bunch of time to get another one made. So we'll just come in with a half 13 tap and a bunch of A9 cutting fluid for aluminum and just power tap it through. This is a great example of how the spiral point tap pushes the swarf out ahead of it, which makes a nice clean hole with no drama. I am keeping a little bit of force down on the quill just to make sure I don't pull the part up out of the tenuous grip that I have on it in the vise. To locate the slots, I am also going to use an appropriate size pin in the drill chuck, but in this case, I'm going to find the locations of both of the slots before I start milling. I'm going to set the absolute zero on the DRO to one of them and the incremental zero to the other. And the reason for this is because I need to take the drill chuck out 
and put a collet in for the end mill and I don't wanna swap the drill chuck back in. So this way I have my two zeros and I can just mill both of these slots. Now it does seem obvious that the X coordinate would be different and I should know the distance between them, but the part isn't perfect. It was laser cut, it was not machined. So I wanted to go ahead and just locate them. They ended up being within about a thou, yeah. Okay, that's way too fast, let's slow that down. They ended up being within about a thou of each other in Y, so it really was pretty close. I just touched off on the top here and then used the knee to raise the mill up a hundred thou because that's the depth of the slot. And then I will just work my way from one end to the other slowly and gently. I don't want to snag the part and rip it out of the vise. I don't think there's much risk there. I do have a relatively firm grip on it, but I didn't want to squeeze it too much and actually deform the part. And once I get the slot in one end done, I will go down to the other end and repeat exactly the same operation. Now on both ends, I took the first pass five thou higher than where I want the final floor to be, lowered it five thou, and then made another pass across just to try to clean up the floor. Oh, and by the way, always try to bump the end of the slot and overcut it by a few thou just for good measure. As long as we're here, we might as well check and make sure they're deep enough. And yes, it looks like the McMaster car model for the carriage bolts was correct. The tool rest already has its mounting holes cut with the laser, but they need to be countersunk. So a flathead screw will fit in below the surface. This is an 82 degree countersink because these are Imperial fasteners with an 82 degree cone angle and they just need to be deep enough to make sure that the screw head is completely below the surface so the work will not snag on it. The friction plate that goes behind the belt needs exactly the same thing. The mounting holes in it also need to be countersunk to the same depth. The last thing we need to do before we can start with some assembly is to tap some of the holes in the powder coated parts. I'm gonna use my 3D printed tap guide here to make sure that the tap's going in straight. If you really wanted to be crazy, you could put the tap in a cordless drill and make short work of this. The holes in the parts were specified to be laser cut to the tap drill diameter, and for the most part, they came out pretty close. There is some powder coating in the hole, but the powder coat just wipes out when you run the tap through it. Oh, and that timer you hear? That means it's time to stop tapping and go do my next set of squats. With those 5 16 holes cleaned up with the rotary deburring tool, I'll flip it over and put the quarter 20 holes in the back. This is the VFD mounting bracket. And then we also need some quarter 20 holes in the backing plate bracket and some 3 8 16 holes in the base plate. I'll have a list of all of the hardware and fasteners required to assemble the grinder up on Patreon. If you recognize these yellow boxes on the bags, you know these all came from McMaster Car. I got the rubber feet, the air spring, the oil light bushings, the kip handles, and the other kind of specialized hardware from there. And all the fasteners came from Bolt Depot. I use these guys all the time. They're really convenient for hobby projects because you can order just what you want. They count the fasteners out, bag them individually, and you don't have to buy bags of a hundred of everything. We'll start the assembly with the base plate and we'll start by putting the rubber vibration damping feet underneath them. These feet just come from McMaster Car, it's a standard product, and they just bolt on with four 3 8 button head screws. I was originally planning to use washers with all of these fasteners so they wouldn't damage the powder coat, but the powder coat turns out to be pretty resilient and it has kind of a secondary effect that it grips the black oxide and acts almost like Loctite or a lock washer to hold the screw in place. Legs go on next and I am using washers under these screws because they're slotted so they're a little bit larger and the washers help to keep the screw from digging in and moving it. We'll leave those loose for now and set them aside while we work on the frame. I do have a set of assembly drawings. These will also be up on Patreon. I put them together for myself mostly so I could remember which size fasteners go in which locations. 
I'll start with the left side plate and install some screws to attach the spacers. I'm ultimately only going to install the nine screws in the center because the six out at the ends are used to attach the legs later. I will put one screw in the end here just to make the alignment a little bit easier. They're all going in loose and then I will come back and tighten down the screws on the center spacer. That's going to be our reference for locating the other two. The top and bottom spacer holes are actually slotted, so there is a little bit of motion here and we need to position it properly. I have an adjustable parallel set to 20 thousandths of an inch wider than the bars that are gonna go in this space. And I'll just use that to line up the top and bottom spacers in the slotted holes to make sure that we have clearance for the bars to slide in easily. The adjustable parallel is a great solution for this. If you don't have one, you could also use the bar itself with a little piece of shim stock or something to make up the extra space. Just do a quick test and make sure that the bar slides in freely and doesn't have a lot of excessive motion. And that looks pretty good. I will put this down because I'm noticing that the screw heads are scratching up my bench. Next up are the kip handles. And of course they won't go into these hexagonal holes directly. We need to put in the flange nuts. And these holes are sized to capture the nuts. Of course, not on this side, the nut will go on the inside and then the kip handle goes through and uses those threads. And to keep the nut from falling out, I've got some springs that fit exactly onto the kip handle. So those just snap on and with a washer, they will retain the nut in the hole and not allow it to fall out. It makes it a lot easier to assemble and keeps things from jamming up in operation. So we just spin this down till the spring is tight and that will hold the nut in place. Get the other three screwed in here. You can see that those handles clear each other and the nuts now won't fall out. Flip this over and grab the right side plate. You can see there are larger holes that fit around the flange and sure enough, as advertised, they fit around the flange. So now we've got the right side plate and the doubler and we'll just screw that down to the spacers. The spacers should already be aligned. I will go ahead and drop in the motor screws here just to make sure that the plate stays perfectly aligned and doesn't get cocked in a way that would make it hard to put these screws in later. There's no adjustment here because the spacers are already in place so I can just tighten all of the screws down. And that is the structure of the frame complete. This is starting to get heavy. We've got three quarter inch steel plates here and some aluminum, but we do have the channels complete. Let's see how the bars fit. And those feel great. And the kip handles locked down nice and firm. The bars nice and solid. I think this is going to work. If we needed to adjust anything, now would be the time to do it. We can still loosen the screws and move those spacers, but once this thing is assembled to the base, that gets a lot more complicated. The frame attaches to the base with the three screws on each end that we left out earlier, and I'll just hold it up here and run those screws in. Uh, by the way, I might be making this look easy, but this is pretty heavy, and just overhand gripping it with my left hand here is probably not the best way to do it. I got it to work, but putting some blocks or something underneath this to help support the weight would make this job a lot easier. Send Cut Send specifies that the bends will be within one degree of what you request, so they're not necessarily perfect, and that's part of the reason for leaving everything loose until this point in the assembly. Oh, and hey, remember that extra screw I put in here for alignment? Yeah, I forgot about it too. So go together a lot better without that extra screw head under the part. With that out, we can go ahead and put the screws in and I'm just kind of moving this around and trying to make sure that it's as aligned as I can get it. And once we have all of these quarter 20 screws tight holding the legs to the frame, then we can come back and align the base and go ahead and tighten down the six screws that hold the legs to the base. And with that step complete, we have the frame and it's a uh, it's starting to pick up some mass. This thing's got some gravity in it. Bars fit nicely and they slide freely and they lock down nicely with the kip handles. I think that is going to work. I'll set the frame aside for now and work on the idler assembly. We'll start with the two carriage bolts that hold the backing bracket on. 
just put those in, flip it over, and mount the bracket with washers and nylon lock nuts. These don't need to be super tight right now. We're going to adjust it later. Then the friction plate goes on the backing bracket, and that just mounts with a couple of flathead screws. The idler wheels go on next. Each wheel is designed to go on with a half inch socket head cap screw. The bearings are pre-installed and held in place with clips, and they each come with a spacer to hold the wheel off of the idler plate. Half inch socket head cap screw goes through, screws down, get those tight, and then we can come back and align the friction plate. Easiest way to do this is just set it down on the bench, lay everything flush, and tighten the nuts. The idler plate goes on the tooling arm with two hex head screws. We've got a half inch screw for the pivot and a 3 8 inch screw for the adjustment lock. So this can rotate 45 degrees either direction and you can just lock it down. I'll just roughly align it for now and then we'll slide it in and out a little bit because it's fun. This is a really smooth motion. I'm really a little bit surprised at how well that works. Tool rest comes next, and it just goes on the bar with a couple of quarter 20 flathead screws. I'll kind of tighten these down progressively to make sure they're both aligned fully in their countersinks before I tighten them, and that'll ensure that everything is square. And that is nice and solid. You never really know until you get to this point in a project how it's really going to come together. The CAD model doesn't really tell you how it's going to feel. As long as we're here, let's see how hard this is to square up. Looks like I didn't get it perfect when I just did it roughly by eye. Go ahead and loosen this and just tap it around until a one, two, three block fits in here nicely. Snug the bolts back down. And yeah, that's pretty simple. I think this tool rest is going to be just about the right size. It's going to be pretty easy to use for the kinds of parts I will want to grind on this machine. Looks good. Well, I think that's where we're going to leave the project for today. We still need to make the tension arm that holds the tracking wheel right about here. And of course, we still need to mount the motor and VFD. Got the seven inch drive wheel. You can see how that's going to fit. Stay. This thing is coming together. It's starting to look like a grinder. This is one of those moments when something that I've been working on, drawing, and dreaming about for over a year suddenly takes on physical form and it's on the bench right in front of me. This is what I love the most about having tools and making things. Next time we'll work on the tension arm and tracking assembly and see how close we can come to getting it running. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for this and all of my other projects and get a little sneak peek behind the scenes. Thank you for watching.